So a field of uh, electrokinetic phenomena, so this is the motion of particles and charges and fluids in response to the electric field, an area which has rapidly advanced in the last 10 years is so-called induced charge electrokinetic phenomena, the most basic being induced charge electroosmosis. Electroosmosis is the uh, motion of an electrolyte or a charge containing or ion containing liquid in response to an electric field. So think of, for example, sodium chloride dissolved in water. You have positive and negative ions, sodium and chloride. And typically, the electrolyte, the liquid, is neutral. So it's roughly equal amounts of positive and negative. But near a boundary, there's always some surface charge or some kind of chemical equilibrium that gets established, which always leads to some surface charge. And then, that as a result, there's an imbalance of positive and negative, for example, sodium and chloride ions, in the liquid near the, near the surface. That structure of charge on the surface plus a, a screening cloud of excess countercharge is called the double layer, the electrochemical double layer. That charge in solution uh, allows a very large force to be put on the fluid if you apply an electric field. Because if you have a neutral bulk system, when you apply an electric field, you know, one ion goes one way, the other ion goes the other way, so the net force on the fluids, or how, where is the fluid being dragged, is, is basically zero or very small. But when you get near the surface and get into one of these double layers, there is a significant imbalance, lots more positive than negative, for example. So if you apply an electric field along the surface, it gets the positives moving one way and only a little bit of negative going the other way, and hence the fluid feels a force and begins to flow. That phenomenon is called electroosmotic flow or electroosmosis. A related phenomenon is electrophoresis. So we just talked about the flow over a surface, uh, which is charged in an electrolyte in response to a field. Now imagine that surface is part of a particle, a solid particle that is charged on its surface, sitting in an electrolyte. Now when I apply a field, it generates these flows around itself, kind of like a flowing kind of skin on the surface. And then essentially you could say it's Newton's third law, you start moving by an equal and opposite reaction in the other direction. So essentially a par charged particle in an electrolyte moves by so-called electrophoresis, and it's essentially a swimming motion. It's sort of like the particle when you apply the field is sort of pushing the fluid behind it and hence is moving forward. And that pushing of the fluid is a relative motion of the fluid relative to the solid caused by the electric field acting on those charges in the surface double layer that I mentioned. Now that phenomenon of electrophoresis of colloidal particles uh, in fact, was in the news not too long ago because we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the discovery of electrophoresis in the earliest reported experiments on clay particles in electric fields by Royce in uh, 1808. So we've just reached the 200th anniversary. So it's a phenomenon that's been observed for a long time. It took about 100 years until the work of Helmholtz and especially Smolikowski around 1905, 1908, uh, for there to be a theoretical description of electrophoresis. So this picture I just gave you of charges near the surface causing a flow around the particle which then makes the particle move, it took about a hundred years to even begin to understand that phenomenon theoretically. So you can imagine it's a relatively complex phenomenon. Then the field progressed uh, for essentially the next century, uh, the last century, by really carefully studying those colloidal phenomena or, or also electroosmotic flows in porous media as well. And I would say that overall, still there was one lingering assumption in almost every study, which was that the surface charge was assumed to be a constant. So the problem is already pretty complicated. If you say, I want to understand the fluid flow of a charged liquid in response to a field, I've got a complicated geometry, the particle's even going to move. If I, on top of that, say the surface charge is changing, it becomes really, really hard. And so that's maybe one of the reasons that people didn't consider that. Also, for many materials, such as the clay particles sitting in solution, the surface charge is roughly constant. It is affected by adsorption and desorption of ions. So for example, if you change the pH, you might change the surface charge. But that's maybe a more gradual effect. And if you just want to understand the motion of the particle, you can, as a first approximation, forget about it. Now, when you have a constant surface charge, you necessarily are in a regime of linear response. Uh, so, well, if the field is not too large, so let me qualify slightly. But if for a typical applied field, 
if you have a constant surface charge, then basically the field acts on the charge in the double layer, gets the fluid to move, and the amount of motion is proportional to the amount of field. So it's a linear response. There has been recent work in the last 10 years, especially, um, in understanding nonlinear electric kinetic phenomena. And this is a major area of my own research. Um, in fact, uh, I had the opportunity to discover, uh, for myself anyway, an example of such a phenomenon about 10 years ago, which is we now call induced charge electrosmosis. And that is really the fundamental problem of what happens when you apply electric field around a surface or a particle which is polarizable. So in other words, the surface charge responds to the field, and in particular, is so-called ideally polarizable, meaning that there's no chemical reaction which is sort of changing the uh, surface charge in sort of space and time in some complex way, but rather is the approximation of a constant potential instead of a constant charge. So the simplest uh, limit of that is just a pure metallic particle with no reaction. So if I take, like, let's say, a metal surface or a metal particle, let's say initially the, the total charge and even the surface charge is roughly zero. But when I apply the field, I get a charge separation. So there is an induced dipole on the object, because it's polarizable. And so what happens is I charge the double layer on one side of the particle positively and the other side negatively. And then the field acts on the induced charge to drive a flow. And so because there's a dipolar charge distribution and a field which is in one direction, you can basically see a flow on one side that is going towards the particle, but on the other side, because the charge is opposite, is actually coming back the other way. So you can generate kind of a quadrupolar flow profile around a particle which we call induced trilotrosmotic flow. And in fact, the interesting thing about this phenomenon, which illustrates the nonlinearity, is that if you change the sign of the field, you change the sign of every induced charge, and you get the same flow. So in other words, it's something which depends on E squared instead of E, where E is the field amplitude. One implication of that is that this flow can survive even in an alternating electric field whose time average is zero. So if I have just linear phenomenon, then if my forcing averages to zero in time, think of an AC electric field, alternating current, then the particle you know, moves back and forth, but really nothing happens on average. But these nonlinear phenomena become important in AC forcing because they rectify the forcing. No matter which way the field's going, you get the same flow. So you can drive a steady flow around an object or around a surface in, a, uh, in an AC field, provided the field is not of too high frequency. So of course, it really or, or t at too high frequency is not enough time for this polarization process. And so this nonlinear dynamics kicks in, and, and you, you are not able to see the flow. So at high frequency, you, you would lose this effect. So basically, I did some theoretical work on this, uh, with, uh, initially with Todd Squires, my uh, co-author. And uh, just as we were getting ready to publish it, and in fact, through the review process, we learned that there was some work in the Soviet Union in the 1980s, which uh, by Vladimir Mirzovkin and Andrei Dukin, which had actually described and, 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 uh, and even done experiments on this very phenomenon. So they have some beautiful uh, pictures published of flows around metal particles in electric fields, which are of the type that we had described. Now, one thing about the new context in the last 10 years is that when Todd and I were first working on that, we weren't really thinking of colloids. So the original motivation of the Soviet Union was if you have particles which are metallic or even dielectric and they have these nonlinear flows around them, it causes interactions between particles. So it will affect the sort of aggregation behavior and dynamics of a colloid. So think it's really in some sense the same problem as Royce was studying you know, 200 years ago, except now it's getting just a little bit more detail. Whereas our motivation was completely different. So at this time, microfluidics was a very hot topic. And I would say it, you know, it still is, but this was kind of in the earlier days. And so this is where fluid mechanics and electrochemistry were starting to meet microfabrication and semiconductor devices. So in the, by the 1990s, people realized that you know, through the fabrication techniques of the semiconductor industry, we can very easily build a very complex controlled microstructures you know, at the scale of, let's say, microns, uh, or even less, even nanoscale devices. And so the question is, what kinds of transport and chemistry can you do in those kinds of systems? And so sometimes they're called lab-on-a-chip devices, but more generally microfluidic or nanofluidic systems. And so what Todd and I were interested in was how do you apply that to generate motion in microfluidic devices? So instead of thinking about how the particle is going to move, but think about the flows themselves as being of interest. And so work that we did and then now many other people have worked on in the last 10 years 
is how do you design geometries of polarizable particles, for example, metal posts, metal electrode arrays, in microchannels in order to get desired flows for mixing and pumping sort of on demand. And the ability to control electrically is very important because if you miniaturize a device, it's kind of difficult to get in there and apply a pressure, for example, to get a flow. It's easier to sort of press a button and, and get a field going between some microelectrodes to, to control particle motion or fluid flow. And so that's the general field of sort of induced charge electrokinetics for, 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 for microfluidics. Um, I would say another interesting uh, part of that work is also looking at broken symmetries. So the classical theory of colloids always starts with a perfect isotropic sphere. It's the simplest problem. You can actually make progress analytically. But what we looked at and what has become an important topic of research is the very complex set of phenomena that can arise when you have broken symmetry. So imagine a particle, a so-called Janus particle, a two-faced particle, uh, which is half metal, half insulator. So for example, like a latex particle covered with gold on half of it. We can make such particles now. They have very interesting behavior. For example, in an applied electric field, we predicted and was later observed that particle will actually move sideways in an AC field rather than forward or backwards. And you can even design objects that will spin in AC fields. Um, and so it just gives you a sense of the very complex nonlinear behavior that can occur when you allow the surface charge to be coupled to the flow. I would say to me, the most interesting part scientifically is not just the applications and the new phenomena that can be observed and, and used for engineering, but it's really that this set of problems has led us to a, a sort of another frontier in theoretical electrochemistry. Electrochemical systems cannot sustain very high voltage for very long, because if you just have a steady voltage applied, then, for example, if you have more than one volt in water, you start to bubble hydrogen and oxygen. You start to decompose the solvent. You have some unwanted reactions maybe that start to occur. And so you're not able to sustain that voltage. But if you have an AC voltage, though, you can be at a high voltage, and those reactions really sort of time average to zero. They don't really happen. So you're able to access a regime of high transient voltages. And this class of induced charge electrokinetic phenomena have to do with large transient voltages in very small geometries. And so it allows you to study electrolytes under conditions that really had never been looked at before. If you think of that double layer, we do experiments now where we might be applying 5 volts at 100 kilohertz to a microelectrode. So you think of the ions are being squashed on and off uh, at 100 kilohertz, so that's 100,000 times per second you're changing the polarity, at a voltage which is five times the electrochemical stability of the system and yet you're not seeing those reactions and you're getting some complex time average flows and it's we found that even our best theories are not able to describe everything that we see so it is really a frontier of theoretical science to uh, understand the nonlinear dynamics of electrolytes in these large transient voltages and i think there'll still be lots more uh, uh, pr progress in that field in the coming years <laughs>